Uh, <laughs> you've been drinking from the fire hoses. If superconductivity is a huge chunk of condensed matter physics. And now I'm going to uh, talk about angle resolved photo emission spectroscopy, which is a very powerful spectroscopy that's applied to. Uh, I want to say almost a every material, but that reflects my bias because I'm usually I'm studying the materials that it, that you can get nice single crystals of or whatever that it can be applied to. Uh, so uh, let's take just a moment to to shake it all out. This is a view of uh, of Washington Square in. Uh, in Manhattan, it's kind of the heart of the NYU campus. There's a uh, there's an arch that was built to celebrate, I think, the triumph of George Washington. It was built somewhat later than the actual triumph, and uh, but it's modeled after the Arc de Triomphe. There's a fountain, and water is falling down here to rejoin the fountain. Uh, this is a famous so-called waterfall image that those of you who've already seen Arpus will uh, possibly be aware of if you follow cuprate superconductors and so on. Um, all right. So what... Uh, okay, down goes forward. So, <laughs> all right. I'm, I'm mostly calibrated now. So uh, <clears throat> the big picture of what I'll be talking about is ARPUS is a technique that measures electronic band structure. I know you've had some exposure to DFT in this and so on. Electronic band structure uh, is, uh, I mean, it's one in, uh, ARPUS measures the electron annihilation spectral function and band structure is what one thinks about mostly in that context. Uh, it is, uh, ARPUS is kind of the broadest and most powerful technique for measuring band structure. Band structure looks like spaghetti and it exists in a four dimensional space. You have three axes of momentum and one axis of energy. Uh, you also have additional axes if you want to imagine them as such that have to do with wave function symmetry. And our brains are optimized for sort of looking at 2D pictures that have color or depth or for, we can deal with three dimensions, but we can't deal with four dimensions. Uh, and the first time one performs an, an ARPUS experiment or dives into an ARPUS paper, I think that is, uh, that is one of the big things, like the, if your brain produced a Wordle from the paper uh, that was your brain's output compiling it, one of the biggest parts would be this is four dimensional, I process in three dimensions. Uh, it would be a compilation error. So just to get warmed up, I'm going to start by showing some band structure uh, from density functional theory from ARPUS and kind of thinking about what's important here, what can we latch on to. Then I'll get into the actual basics of how the technique is performed, uh, how you get these, uh, these measurements, and uh, zoom in a little bit more for a couple of the uh, of the interesting cases that, well, ways that ARPUS is used on quantum materials, on topological materials, and on superconductors. Uh, and, uh, and at the end, I'll talk about some new applications of ARPUS, uh, spectral microscopy, pump probe. Uh, so let's, let's move forward with that. Uh, these are uh, density functional theory simulations uh, showing the Fermi surface of UTE2 uh, with different tuning parameters. U is a tuning parameter that describes how electrons, how strongly they interact when they're on the same atom in the same, in the same orbitals. Uh, and uh, we have ARPUS on, on this material too that I'll show some pictures from. Uh, these are just taken as an example because for one material you can get profoundly different Fermi surfaces. So this is uh, what the first Brion zone looks like in three dimensional momentum, three dimensions of momentum. The Fermi surface is showing 
uh, is showing where electrons hit the Fermi level. So uh, just so that I can uh, connect with you a little bit about uh, it's a big part of the challenge in, in uh, performing ARPUS is actually thinking about what band structure means. Like what, these are, these are predictions that exist side by side in the same paper. And they look very different. Uh, what does that mean? What does the difference mean? If we can say that this one is right or this one is right, what, what are the consequences for our understanding of the material or uh, is this simply a cross-section of spaghetti Alfredo and this is linguine and, and it's, it's all a matter of taste. So uh, uh, what I will, uh, from the Fermi surface it can actually be, you don't get all the information just looking at the Fermi surface. Again, this is, this is three-dimensional and the Fermi surface is one representation that's, that's nice because it, our three-dimensional brains can see it. But then you have an energy axis that tells you, uh, that tells you like the velocity of these electrons at the Fermi level, that tells you the density of states associated with them. You can't see that from, you can't see everything in one shot. Just looking at the Fermi surface, does anyone know uh, like how this scenario might be different from, from these scenarios, like some, something you might expect in many body physics uh, as a consequence of it being this instead of, instead of one of those. Uh, this, is, this is a genuinely uh, hard question as in uh, some of the things bouncing around in, in your brains right now are correct and are not in my head. Uh, but with, uh, I'm going to so I'm going to let the question hang in the air because this is the kind of question that we ask ourselves like for hours on end as we perform ARPUS experiments and look at these and obsess over DFT simulations. Uh, but now that it's hung for a little bit, I'll fill in the most straightforward answer if you only see the Fermi surface, which is that uh, if there's a density wave in the material, if electrons organize in a way so that you have more density here, more electrons here, less here, fewer, more density here, less here, and so on, you can break the translational symmetry of the crystal. You can create a new periodicity. And that will, uh, that will have some uh, one over, two pi over the wavelength will be a distance in momentum space. And if that couples between flat Fermi sheets, that can commandeer these electrons, then that means it can commandeer the, these electrons into the density wave. And that a density wave that has the right periodicity to couple between sheets and connect a lot of electrons will potentially be a strong density wave. So both of these cases have parallel sheets and maybe, and, and you have to think maybe there might be strong density waves there. This guy, you don't have huge parallel sheets. You don't have, there's no periodicity you could introduce that would couple a whole bunch of electrons at the Fermi level. So this one, uh, unfortunately for this material, it's not really a density wave material, but there might be some interesting sort of near density wave. Uh, instability physics going on. Anyway, so Fermi surface, you can think about that sort of thing. It turns out this one, if we actually do a measurement, this is a measurement showing uh, a cross section in the uh, in the plane of the uh, of the square on top, and you do get something that looks like this. And it it doesn't depend it doesn't really depend on what plane you get into. It's a very two dimensional. Uh, system effectively. So, whereas these would be more three-dimensional systems as well. So this seems to be sort of the right answer from uh, within, if you have to limit it to one of these. And ARPUS uh, is the technique that you can turn to to get that answer relatively quickly. Yeah. Inside the enclosed, kind of enclosed sheet is filled. Uh, it's you can't tell. Uh, one of these, uh, one of these sheets. This, uh, so this is actually 
you see these, oh, these look like, uh, these look like warped sheets. They're actually made out of flat sheets. One that goes along here and one, well, a couple that go like this and a couple that go like this and that, that open up gaps where they intersect each other. So these flat sheets, uh, this pair, uh, the middle has electrons under the Fermi level. This one, uh, uh, along here, these, these, this band does not have electrons under the Fermi level uh, here. Instead, they are, uh, instead they are uh, above the Fermi level, and out here, they're beneath the Fermi level. On the, so yeah, you just can't tell. Uh, you, need to, you need to go to the next slide. Um, where I'm, I'm, may, maybe I'm projecting. Uh, I am projecting. Uh, that was... All right. So, uh, if you look at each one of at each of those simulations with different U tuning parameters, uh, you get this sort of spaghetti picture. Energy is on this axis. Momentum is on this axis. This snakes a weird path through momentum space. I'm showing this because it's scary. Uh, this is what you see uh, in an ARPUS paper. And this path through, through three-dimensional momentum space that you're following the, the bands along uh, is kind of hard to make sense of. It takes a little while. You have, to, you have to be serious about it or have it sort of carefully interpreted. Uh, and that's OK. Uh, it's all I really want to draw attention to here is that this is a scenario where you have relatively flat bands at the Fermi level, this one too, uh, this one too. This one you don't. You have the bands all have a slope as where they hit the Fermi level. Uh, slope is the group velocity of the of the particles. So these are particles that travel fast at the Fermi level. These all have particles that travel extremely slowly at the Fermi level, which makes it very easy to incorporate them in density waves. Actually, so this scenario. Uh, where you have some parallel sheets and the particles are very slow moving, this would really potentially want to, to be a density wave material. It would want to have some sort of translational symmetry breaking. That can even be a spin density wave, that, which would be antiferromagnetism, a form of antiferromagnetism. So, and again, it's going to turn out to be this one. If we do the, the measurement and align the instrument so that we get uh, we see energy and momentum. This is actually a direct sort of mapping from a CCD image. So we get this picture. This is the picture that's spat out at us when the measurement is configured correctly. We have, this is a band. It's parabolic up. So, uh, and so it's, uh, it's like a massive particle. And that's this band. And this one shooting down, that's this much more, more sloped state. So we see these states. Uh, and when ARPUS works well, it gives you a simple picture that, that as long as you know sort of what, what region corresponds to what region of momentum space, you, you can kind of verify the band structure. You can understand what electrons are available at the, at the Fermi level. You can get out uh, a lot of information that's, that's fantastic if you have a model. And even if you don't, as I'll get into when we get into more, uh, more specific examples later, even if you don't, you get sort of model a, a model independent understanding of what these electrons are like and what might happen uh, when you include broader many body physics. Uh, I, a big part of why I find ARPUS to be interesting is that DFT-based uh, simulations are performed for everything, uh, but they do not always work. They do not always have the physics that you need to understand particles. Uh, the, the biggest word representing a failure of DFT uh, for me is correlations. Uh, which basically means when electrons interact very strongly with one another locally, uh, they will, uh, they can give you, that can give you a wave function that density functional theory uh, has no way of representing. And as such, it can only lead you astray in terms of related, certain related properties. So uh, when, uh, when you have 
a simple band structure picture that density functional theory can latch onto. One way of saying that is that your system is itinerant. Uh, this is uh, these are actually simulations in a different uh, modeling approach, DMFT, that keeps certain kinds of correlations. I'm not supporting this paper in particular. I just really like that they they plotted a series where you're turning on the correlate the interact these strong interact local interactions. So here you have an itinerant side where uh, this is a material where you filled up this is density of states. You filled up a bunch of states and you have a partially filled band at the Fermi level. It's actually two bands that are partially filled filled at the Fermi level. And that means that it's a metal. If you have partially filled bands, your system is a, is a metal. Uh, it's not magnetic, nothing else is really going on. Uh, if you turn on correlations uh, by replacing selenium with sulfur if you're, if you're growing the crystals, uh, there are two orbital degrees of freedom here. And uh, the, the electrons, there, there are two electrons in them. So you have, that means you haven't filled up the bands because to fill them up, you'd have to fill up two orbitals times two spins that you need four electrons per unit cell of the crystal. You've only got two. Uh, but if the spins really want to align on the same atoms, then they can do that. You can put one electron in each orbital and align their spins. Now, uh, that's a that's an example of a correlation of a strong correlation. If the spins align on each atom, then it becomes a spin one system. The spins align two spin one halves give you a spin one, and uh, it stops being a metal because suddenly there's an. It doesn't want you to put in a third spin. It's very happy being a third electron. It's very happy being spin one, and if it's not magnetic, if the if you don't have magnetic correlate strong magnetic correlations from one site to the next. Uh, you have something that DFT says has to be a metal because it has half-filled orbitals, uh, but that the correlations say will be insulating. There are no states at the Fermi level in the correlated picture. So this is a model that, that tries to see what correlations do. First you have states at the Fermi level, which is zero energy here. You start turning on correlations, dispersions get flatter, stuff gets broader, it gets weird. Eventually you don't have anything at the Fermi level. Uh, there's no model that everyone agrees with for how this happens, for what's going on in the middle. Uh, so being able to measure, being able to see uh, how uh, how this picture evolves is of fundamental importance to our understanding and to going uh, to for quantum materials where you uh, for for sort of the half of quantum materials where strong correlations are important. Uh, this is uh, experiment kind of uh, kind of needs to lead the way on this on understanding how we should, on showing us how we should think about the electronic structure. All right, uh, that was some heavy stuff. Uh, in particular, like I could spend, oops, I could spend a whole group meeting going over this and my graduate students at the end of it would still be like, yeah, I kind of, kind of know what he was talking about. Uh, but uh, so so again, this is this is to delve into what one thinks about in thinking about the Arbus technique. Uh, this is a stru the structure of an Arbus beam line at a synchrotron. You have uh, you have something that's uh, you have an electron beam that passes through an undulator, has an undulating magnetic field, uh, spits out a lot of X-rays. Uh, you have apertures and mirrors and gratings that, that isolate uh, just, the, just one energy uh, from this and keep as much flux as possible and try to keep it in a precise, uh, a small focused spot on the surface. The mirrors are focusing mirrors. Um, a toroidal mirror here. It hit the X-rays hit the surface of your sample, or, or X-rays or, or UV photons hit the surface of your sample, and knock out electrons. So these are this is what we care about. Uh, we're knocking out electrons. They're going into into a detector uh, that has a strong electric field that's pushing the electrons down. The farther they fly uh, after they get in, the more energy they had. 
coming in. So you can see what energy these electrons have by where they hit a CCD detector over here. You can also see what momentum they had because you allow them to come into this at different angles along a slit. So you can see momentum along one axis and you can see energy. That's how you get these pictures where you have energy and momentum. And uh, they're actually rather complicated electrostatic lenses and magnetic and electric field distributions uh, inside of this that are not magnetic, only electrostatic fields that, that shape the path of, of these to give so that of these electrons so that what you see on the CCD is really uh, is really something that's resolved uh, in with an ac a clean axis of, of momentum and a clean axis of energy. Uh, this is uh, what makes it all work is the photo is the photoelectric effect that Einstein uh, helped uh, helped figure out for us in 1906. Uh, basically, what this is saying is that most of the time when we put light in, we are uh, the photons are being absorbed by single electrons and then the material spits that electron out. The electron will not absorb two photons at the same time, most likely, if your beam of light isn't incredibly intense. Um, so you can say that the energy of the electron that comes out is the energy of the photon you put in minus the work function of the material, the energy difference between vacuum and the Fermi level, uh, minus the binding energy that the electron had in the material. So these are just constants and uh, in fact, this work function bec becomes pinned to the work function of stainless steel, so it's always like 4.35 eV uh, because your instrument is a huge chunk of stainless steel. And, and your samples, you want them to be at least somewhat metallic for this to, to work well. And uh, uh, so what you get is measurements where the energy of the photon of the electron you got out is uh, just shifts in tandem with the binding energy, and where you can see the Fermi level because that's the because you stop seeing any electrons above the Fermi level. There are none to knock out. Uh, this is a picture that's in every review article, every early review article on ARPUS. Uh, so inside your sample, you think of there as being some. Uh, some Luttinger liquid or some, some set of, of states near the Fermi level that are filled. This is density of states and you have core levels as well. You put in uh, photons with uh, an energy that's this big on this scale and in space you just see some like resolution broad. Well, you knock them out and measure and you see resolution broadened uh, representations of the density of states. Yeah. Yes, uh, when you interface metals, they align work functions. So the ARPES, uh, if you do an ARPES experiment, you cannot tell what the work function of the sample of interest is? Uh, that's correct. Um, in fact, yeah, if, it's, if your sample is too insulating, as you knock electrons out, you'll be charging the surface and it'll seem like the workshop function is shifting in time or is shifted to something artificial. So there's no way around it. It's either metallic and aligned or, or, or not grounded and, and changing. How can you determine the frame well, the work function is fixed, but the Fermi, the Fermi energy uh, is, uh, oops, this, uh, the Fermi energy, you don't see any electrons above there. This is, a, a, this is, again, what we see on a detector after counting for a long time. And here's a band. It just seems to stop where it hits the Fermi level. We would love to see the band continuing above the Fermi level. We just don't. There are no electrons to knock out of the material. At the end, I'll show you that with pump probe arpus, and there are other ways to do it, you can actually, by like throwing electrons in, instead of taking them out, you can see states above the Fermi level. And it's really cool. Um, does that you Let's say um, you are uh, throwing two electron volts, uh, 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 like photon, yeah. and then your volt function is uh, 2.3 electron volts. Yeah. Then even though uh, uh, you have a uh, 
state and uh, let's say um, you're not going to see anything. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So what you need is, again, because the work function is always like 4.35 or whatever, it's, it actually varies on the order of uh, 50 MeV or the calibration of energy varies on that order, whatever. Uh, so I can't give a very, such a precise number for every ARPAS instrument. Because that's what you see, uh, and for every experiment, uh, it's going to, uh, if you put in less than 4.35 EV, you see nothing. When ARPUS is done with lasers, you always, so visible light doesn't give it to you. Uh, when ARPUS is done with lasers, you need to up the, the frequency of the laser as much as you can uh, to, to get electrons out. Can I yeah. to paraphrase that so I understand? Your sample is measured to the stainless steel. So yeah. Very energies. The potentials are equal. Yeah. And so you need to get above the work function of this. Yeah. And then the zero, you know, the zero is just we're just start to see. So it'll be four point three five. Exactly. Exactly. So we often we all so. This is often written as binding energy, in which case these numbers are all positive because this is the energy you have to pay to get an electron out beyond what you, beyond what you paid to get to the Fermi level. So it's always uh, relative to the Fermi level. Sometimes this is just called energy, in which case these numbers will be negative because binding energy means larger potential energy, means more negative energy. Um, it's uh, sometimes people will specifically reference the Fermi level in describing this axis. The conventions are many and manifold, but again, because this axis is arbitrary except for the Fermi level, zero is always set to the Fermi level, or to some feature like this Dirac point is sometimes set to zero. Yeah. It that's it can get down to. In the very, so in general at synchrotrons, let's say 10 MeV. 10 MeV is a great operating mode for ARPUS because most bands are broader than that and yet it's narrower than KBT. You can see a lot of effects related to low temperature physics. Um, as you start pushing beneath that, you're your beam spot actually is convoluted with the angle that electrons sort of come out at and, and, and get in the detectors, convoluted in with your resolution. And the roughness of the crystal surface and so on. So uh, our system uh, at, in, in my lab is nominally 2 MeV, 1.8 or something. I would, I would never, you know, when we use us in, when we optimize for resolution, I would never count on it really being smaller than four, like if I had to bet my life. There are systems that have 50 micro EV resolution. Uh, I've never seen 50 micro EV resolved data. Uh, I, it would have to be a superconducting gap, something that that is really specifically localized at the Fermi level and, and very sharply resolved. That's the only thing I can think of that where that extreme resolution would really even work. Yeah. Does the Uh, by population, you mean brightness? Brightness mostly tells you how light is coupling to the electrons because these electrons are in different orbitals. It doesn't, uh, you, can, you can integrate over momentum and get something that's called ARPAS DOS, which is proportional to DOS, but it has big matrix elements as the, due to the changing orbital symmetries and so on, due to the changing sensitivity to the light. So it does, but but it, it but people often don't go there because it can be hard to pull out what you really want. So you can assume density of states from. You can assume that you'll probably see the inflections and features that are in density of states, but that your amplitudes will be off by some changing factor. And my other question um, was: Is it possible to do those multiple where the energy is not going to be exactly where they went from? So with insulators, uh, people have done it with like nickel oxide. I've done it on insulating uh, undoped cuprates. It can work. Uh, what tends to happen is that you will, your surface will be charged to some degree. You'll, you're knocking electrons out. And uh, 
And that, will, that charge is associated with a potential. So when I was measuring, say, strontium copper oxide 112, I remember that the band structure, it looked like the work function was about 50 electron volts, not, not 4.3. Uh, sometimes people use an electron gun to replace those, but that can screw up your surface in other ways, so, uh, and can impact resolution, uh, it, it, and it's hard to tune, and, and it, it adds an element, to, um, sort of a moving part to the measurement. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, more questions? So the next is the issue. Yeah. That would be angle integrated, that's right. This is, so if you, in fact, to do this, you'd have to integrate over the three-dimensional angle space or have a 2D material. And it's this, getting a strict representation of density of states that's not just from a, oops, that's not just from a, a 2D, not just from a single momentum axis is hard, it takes more work. Uh, we have 2D density of states you can get relatively easy. 3D density of states takes a lot of measurement time. Uh, uh, one last question because this is actually a nice place to dwell and then I'll move on with, yeah. Uh, so, uh, the wavelength of light is really like, change or? Uh, we change it during the experiment. We keep it constant for one measurement because that's, because if we changed it during the measurement, we'd find these bands would get really broad. Uh, they wouldn't be, this, this band, if I, if I change the energy by one EV, all of these features will move up by one EV. Uh, but something else will happen. I'll change the momentum that I'm probing. So let's move on to that. Uh, when an electron comes out of the material, the momentum in the plane of the material uh, is conserved because nothing, you're not breaking translational symmetry in the plane, we assume. You could be by roughness, through roughness and so on, which might broaden stuff or give you a bunch of, give you extra scattering. But let's, but to a good approximation, it's conserved. And that means you can just uh, measure the energy of this electron and the angle it comes out at and derive what momentum it had inside the, in what in-plane momentum it had inside the material. That's what these equations represent. The momentum normal to the crystal surface is not conserved. We have an approximation where we throw in an extra fudge factor that we call the inner potential, uh, which uh, also, uh, also describes uh, how much the material will, will transcend as it moves on into the next life, or uh, its aptitude for Gnostic Christianity. Uh, so this inner potential is a constant, usually on, on the order of 0 to 15 eV, uh, and it is totally a fudge factor. It changes, it, you, we treat it as a constant, it's not. Uh, anyway, we can throw that in and use the same sort of linear, linear algebra to get an estimate of the surface normal uh, momentum. And, uh, uh, let's see, if you want to play with the linear algebra of how you map from the angle space of the electron coming out at some angle to, uh, to momentum space, I really recommend this paper. It's in a list of, in a link that has a bunch of references that I'll post at the end. This is the only paper I've found that actually posts like the transformation, shows the transformation matrices so you don't have to derive them yourself. <coughs> Now, something else is going on here, though. Uh, the electron that you knock out, uh, if you want to probe a state that has in-plane momentum, uh, the electron that in free, the, the electron you knock out has to have that in-plane momentum. And there's some minimum energy to have, the in uh, to have a given in-plane momentum. Momentum in free space, uh, momentum squared divided by mass is the energy of the, of the electron. So, uh, covering momentum space, you usually need at least a 15 eV light source to cover a full first Brion zone. Uh, to, uh, 15 eV will get you just to the edge of the Brion zone for graphene, which has a huge first Brion zone. Uh, actually, you need something bigger for graphene because you get aberrations as you get to the very edge. So uh, the photon energy you're using tells you how much of 2D momentum space you can see because of these uh, geometric considerations. 
or momentum energy con considerations. And one last thing, uh, if you really want to play games with this, uh, ARPAS, the polarization that you're using for measurement, can uh, be used to look at like orbital symmetries and wave function symmetries in your material. It will not give you the superconducting gap function symmetry. That phase is a two particle phase and ARPAS is measuring single particles that come out. So that phase is lost to ARPAS. Uh, <clears throat> And because it's shared between two electrons, one of which you don't get. But when you're measuring electronic states, uh, if the material has a reflection symmetry along the axis that you're performing the experiment on, actually, it, it, uh, then uh, the wave function will will have to, if the in the absence of spin orbit coupling, which breaks this a little bit, the wave function will have even or odd reflection symmetry. So it'll be sort of like minus minus across a across any mirror plane, or minus plus. And uh, the free particle state that you're that you're escaping to, fr a free particle state has even reflection symmetry. It looks like a plane wave. Uh, so. Uh, in Braquette notation, it looks like you're, you're projecting into a state with even reflection symmetry, and your polarization introduces a matrix element. If your polarization is along this axis, it's going to multiply onto the wave function with, with, a, with an odd reflection symmetry. Um, and uh, because your polarization, you have this well, let's let's take that for uh, I uh, I won't dwell on that for for a second. I will recommend this this review. So uh, so if you put polarization in this plane, you'll see states that are reflection odd. Uh, if you put polarization out of the plane, you'll see states that are reflection even. Your matrix element will be even. So uh, so you'll be taking an even. Uh, symmetry state, putting it through an even symmetry, multiplying on an even symmetry matrix element and putting it into an even symmetry free particle state. Uh, so the polarization selects the kinds of states that you can see. Uh, reflection symmetry goes away when you have strong spin orbit coupling. Uh, it's simply, it, there's a modified symmetry reflection dot product with a Pauli vector. And that means that that in certain systems like topological insulators, uh, you don't have strict selection rules for what bands you can see in this sort of case. And many ARPA systems actually don't give you a high symmetry geometry to begin with, so you get a mixture of everything. But, uh, but you have tools like this. You can also resolve the spin of electrons that come out in some cases. So there are extra elements that you can, of symmetry that can be resolved in the measurements. The photoemission process, uh, the most common way I, I would say to think about it is to say that uh, you have states inside the material, you're exciting them with light at some energy to free particle states that tunnel into the material. And uh, because electrons scatter a lot, these free particle states will only tunnel coherently for a nanometer or so. So there's, uh, this is the so-called universal curve for how far electrons will move inside a material. Uh, as you, you, ARPAS is usually performed uh, around here. This is 20 eV up to, let's say, 100 or so eV. In this region, you expect a penetration depth on the order of a nanometer or less. Uh, that's very shallow. It means that you're very sensitive to surface states. But bulk states are there too. And you will also interrogate them. Uh, as you vary instant photon energy, you're changing the surface normal momentum that you see. And you'll see that states disperse in a, representing the bulk dispersion. So, so you can see bulk states, but you're very sensitive to anything that impacts the surface chemistry or that you need to see through. It's hard to see through stuff that's at the surface. If you see 3D dispersion, that tells you that you're seeing the bulk states, but it's often on top of a lot of background. Um, as you go to lower photon energies, like if you're using lasers uh, to do it, uh, you'll notice that this penetration depth can go way up, up to maybe even like 10 nanometers, which is much less sensitive to the outermost monolayers of atoms. Uh, that's because this picture is breaking down a little bit. Uh, people start using a, a more... Uh, 
a, a picture with a higher number of steps where you're exciting from an, a state inside the material to band structure above the Fermi level, which is also fair, has a fairly long mean free path. And then that, then you're jumping from that into a free particle state. So, uh, so that's great in that it lets the, the electrons travel farther in the material, it lets you probe more, it, but it messes with the symmetries of the electrons that you see a bit because you have some extra projection onto band structure symmetries inside the material. Especially if you're trying to get like spin resolution of states, uh, that, can really, that can really change it because you're projecting onto the spins of other states and then taking the electron out. So you could be rotating your spin before it comes out. Uh, as you go to much higher energies, your penetration depth increases and people use that to see uh, more into the bulk. But your energy resolution also balloons to, in this energy range you're talking, about, photon energy range, you're talking about like 100 MeV, 150 MeV resolution usually. And your signal becomes very, very weak. Uh, so what you get can, can look very ugly and there are certain background issues as well. So in general, uh, this is just an overview sli slide that you can return to if you're thinking about what light sources are, are good for what you want. Uh, lasers are great at low photon energies. This is showing peak brightness. What we really want is average brightness, but, uh, but I couldn't find something that, that showed that. Uh, at least not in not very quickly. Uh, so lasers work well as you get to sort of the 10 MeV range. There's a 15 MeV laser that's being sold these days that that's really neat uh, using higher harmonic generation. Uh, the uh, synchrotrons start stepping in from from the very lowest energy range too. And peak brightness is low for synchrotrons, but average brightness is good. So they. Uh, certain synchrotrons like SSRL smaller synchrotrons will take you down to the very lowest photon energies that matter rather nicely and give you very good resolution. Uh, synchrotrons stay in the game throughout uh, the energy range that matters up to 1000 EV. Uh, FELs are interesting because like lasers, free electron lasers can give you a, an ultra fast pulse to measure with. But they give you too many photons and that becomes a problem. Uh, what's going to happen if we have too many photons? Yeah, I, I think I, I heard the sort of the right answer in a couple. You'll be building up a space charge. You'll be building up a charge even though it's a metal and it can screen the charge quickly. Uh, there what you really care about is the peak brightness because because if you can, because the metal's trying to screen very quickly, but if the peak brightness is really large, it won't be able to screen during the, during the peak of your pulsed uh, source. Synchrotrons are also a pulsed source, by the way. It's just that they're, they have very long pulses. So, uh, and resolution gets, gets worse as you go up through the energy range, uh, sort of, 20 to 100 EV tends to be kind of a sweet spot for having still quite good resolution on the order of 10 MeV and having a great signal. Bulk penetration is poor, but it, that usually works out. And the emission process is relatively simple compared to the low energy range. So this is uh, this uh, a helium lamp. Uh, these are specs for a helium lamp system that I have in my in my lab, a helium lamp is sort of like a neon, a neon light bulb, only uh, we throw away the visible light and uh, it has a 21 EV line that, we, that has very good brightness for doing this. So we use it for measurements on 2D electron systems. Uh, it doesn't matter, the 3D band structure doesn't matter, it's a 2D band structure. And as long as you have more than 15 EV, you can cover the first Brion zone of, of anything. So, so we particularly like 2D uh, band structures. Uh, I mostly threw this up because it illustrates sort of typical beam spots these days for what something that you don't call spectral microscopy or sort of 100 to, to 500 microns. Uh, we can tune ours, uh, not easily, but. And temperature, everyone's temperature range is six and a half to 400 Kelvin, basically. Uh, that's just what the standard manipulators give you. It limits the range of quantum materials you can study because there's a lot as you push down to really low temperatures. Uh, this is just the, the fact that your sample is exposed to light, uh, to ambient room temperature 
uh, photons. Um, this is part, coupled to a bunch of other instrumentation so we can grow samples and send them in. Uh, so, all right. Let me get to a couple of specific examples uh, for topological materials and for superconductors. And then that's kind of the extent of the basic uh, stuff that I want to cover. Uh, just to give, uh, let me go for a little walk because uh, a little victory lap, we've finished a chunk of the introducing the technique. Uh, all right, I feel like I'm back where I started. Uh, so, uh, ARPUS on topological materials has been a really big deal recently, in part because ARPUS was the technique that worked to show that things were topological insulators from the beginning. And it's the, it's the only technique that's utterly reliable in seeing to topological properties in these materials. Uh, I see, say utterly, but let's very, uh, uh, so, of course, the 2016 Nobel Prize uh, honored the, the early days of, of quantum topology. Uh, Duncan Haldane is someone that I loved to talk to when I was at Princeton. And uh, a general theme for these things is that they have some sort of insulating state in the bulk of a material, and then they have required edge states that have a form uh, involving maybe uh, the spin momentum relationship of well spin the spin orientation of states as a function of where they are in momentum sp in momentum space or uh, uh, other properties of the band structure that tells you that the the material has a topological quantum order <coughs> I'm not really going to introduce that other than showing some pictures of what it looks like. This is one of the original uh, ARPUS measurements on, uh, on business selenide, which is thought of as a model topological insulator. Topological insulators are associated with Dirac cone electrons. So these are electrons that, these are, this is an electronic surface state uh, that if you show it in, uh, in two dimensions of momentum and one of energy, it looks like a cone, and the electrons, depending on the direction they're moving, uh, they have a fixed spin. Uh, the spin orientation wraps around this cone. Uh, that's, this is rep this is a classic example of the more basic property of topological insulators, which is that uh, you have an insulating gap. This is, these are the conduction states, valence states are down here. Inside here you have a bulk band gap. If you start at a high symmetry point, uh, this zero momentum is a high symmetry point, and go to another so-called Kramer's high symmetry point, you will cross exactly one, uh, or an odd number, sorry, of surface state bands. And this is singly degenerate because it's spin polarized. So you will cross this one band as you go through. It's the, sort of the simplest case that you can have. And here's a picture of the 2D Fermi surface with the spins labeled. So it's sort of like looking down on this, on a cross section of this cone. And you see the bulk states there too. Uh, this is actually, people always show these zoom ins. It's actually tiny relative to the Brion zone. It doesn't involve that many electrons beneath the Fermi level, uh, which makes it hard to couple to these electrons. But ARPUS doesn't care because ARPUS will zoom in on the part of momentum space that you want. You'll only measure there, and it will fill up your, your field of view. So uh, ARPUS, these ARPUS pictures, because you see v things that look big in the picture, they can be misleading in terms of the actual number of electrons that are there. You need to sort of look at how big the momentum axis is. Um, <clears throat> there are some, uh, this is kind of a good time to stop and talk about what you can get from this in the absence of a model. Uh, density functional theory uh, will predict these surface states. So you can, you can get a model that will show these things. But it will, show, it will just show a line where if you zoom on this, it has width on, in momentum and energy. Uh, it, uh, the slope will not match density functional theory. So 
so you actually, by, by having this experimental measurement, you get a bunch of stuff for free. You get the slope at the Fermi level tells you the Fermi velocity of the band, how fast electrons at the Fermi level are moving. Uh, one over this width, uh, if you take the, if you, th if this looks like a Lorentzian and you take the peak width at half maximum, one over that width is about the mean free path that the electrons are traveling. Um, that can be, by the way, that can be very easily screwed up by uh, resolution issues or if there's roughness on a, on a surface so that the surface normal is pointing in different directions. You can get multiple images of the same band if the surface is very rough or you can just, if it's just a little rough, you can get broadening of this. So, so one doesn't count on the mean free path estimates to, to be correct. Um, those momentum resolution issues uh, also affect the energy axis because you're shifting a sloped feature. Uh, but uh, uh, anyway, you can uh, get an estimate of scattering lifetime from one over the energy width. It's the same sort of thing. Uh, I'm, this, this tends to work, but one just needs to watch it when it's, if you think that it's plateaued at some minimum number, you just can't count on that. If there's temperature dependence and you see it growing, then that, that has to be real. But um, let's see. Uh, so uh, again, you can get density of states either from integrating over space or by tracing the bands and saying, if the bands have this dispersion that I've traced, what density of states is associated with that? Uh, that's what people tend to think of as being more reliable. It's not always, uh, especially near a Dirac point, there, there are subtleties. Uh, let's see, and again, nesting instabilities. This is, these are for a related topological insulator, bismuth telluride, this is what the Fermi surface, well, what constant energy cuts look like. And much has been made of the fact that this band runs parallel to this one in a narrow window. So you could have a, uh, a density wave that coupled between these that would have, uh, that would incorporate the spin momentum locking of the Fermi state and have some mixture of charge and spin density that would be kind of cool to see. Uh, so you can look for these sorts of parallel uh, surfaces and, and suggest maybe there will be a density wave. Uh, I don't think anyone's actually seen it in this particular case. It's a shame. Doing an ARPUS experiment on bismuth selenide uh, is something like this. You have a crystal and you glue a top post on top of it. You glue a, a little piece of ceramic and you whack that with, a, uh, with some part of your instrument inside. Uh, there's nothing scientific about the whacking. Uh, it's, I say this because everyone, the first time you cleave a sample, it's like, all right, I have to get this right. And uh, I, in, a, in my years of doing it, I have learned almost nothing. You just, you touch the top post with enough force that it will break the crystal. And the crystal wants to cleave, it's a layered compound in this case, so you will knock off the top of the crystal and get a surface that's never been exposed to air. That's how you get a clean surface usually if you're not growing or, and uh, doing a lot of work to, to, clean, a, uh, to clean the surface. So uh, your light will penetrate in. Here we used 10 EV photons and we saw maybe a couple of nanometers into the crystal. Uh, we saw a clean bulk band here when we did that and we see the surface state. This is the bulk conduction band. Uh, then we used 22 EV electrons and we saw maybe a nanometer in the, into the crystal. And the bulk band became ugly. We started seeing lots of different momenta at the same z-axis momenta at the same time from the bulk band. Uh, they make it look like a filled cup. The surface state looks the same. Uh, and don't trust the, in the intensity because it's not normalized to anything. It's just, it's just to show contrast. Um, so what's going on is when we look in the top nanometer of the crystal, that's where the surface state lives and it quantum excludes the bulk. And the bulk band has a, the wave function has a slope as you get towards the surface of the crystal uh, that mixes uh, different z-axis momenta in your measurement. So what you're seeing here is that the surface state occupies, uh, sort of excludes the bulk as you get towards the surface. 
Um, that's a common theme for topological insulators. Here's bismuth telluride. Here's the, the surface state. And this broad thing is the, is the bulk uh, valence band. It shouldn't be broad like this. You should be able to momentum resolve it. You just don't because the surface state convolution with it uh, gives you something that blurs all the z-axis momentum. Yeah. So do, do people ever combine the energy spectrum and try to make a composite? Yeah. Uh, I have a paper, uh, actually the nature physics paper that this PRB expanded from uh, shows uh, like a half EV step, energy step in this window, which shows the, the dispersion of this band. So you, so you do definitely look at z-axis dispersion when you can resolve it. Um, it's, it tends to be uglier. Uh, for reasons that I could, the, you, your, matri your emission matrix elements are changing at the same time. And so it doesn't always give, you can see the band moving, but the background can be very strange. Yeah. Yeah? Uh, can, is donor space or acceptor in purity space invisible in They tend to be very sparse. And they're spread out over all momentum space. So, so if you have like 1% doping, uh, you have 1% of an electron in these states, and it's spread out over all momentum space, so it just gives too little signal. But they, they, they're not necessarily invisible, but they, they tend to be. So if I see the publications, are they like filtered out? Or? No. No, you never filter something out of your data. You Sometimes people subtract background uh, of different sorts, which can be sketchy. But In principle, you would, but the flat line is going to be so, it'll be, let's say, three orders of magnitude less intense than the bands that we're seeing here. Uh, so, all right, the last thing that I want to get to as a science example is superconductors, since we were just talking about them. Uh, the, f the big picture thing is that with ARPIS, you can directly see the superconducting gap. You see a band approaching the Fermi level, and it stops. It doesn't make it all the way to the Fermi level. Here is actually as a function of incident photon energy. So mapping z-axis momentum, you see how big the gap is. Zero is the Fermi level. Zero to whatever this is is the gap size in an iron arsenide material. Uh, you often, you'll often see people symmetrize their data, which is where they just reflect it across the, across the Fermi level and add the two spectra. That is a sketchy practice that nonetheless sort of lets you see what the full gap probably looks like. Um, and lets you see if, if your resolution might be inadequate to resolve the full gap. It, uh, and, uh, other things that you can get from, so you can map the, super, the gap, you can see where it goes to zero because, again, with these like D wave order parameters, there are places where the, where the uh, superconducting wave function goes to zero, and there you'll see the gap vanish as you approach those points. Another thing people look for is if you get the Fermi velocity and you know the gap size, there's an equation to estimate the, uh, the size of a Cooper pair. That's kind of cool. You can get a sense of, uh, that can also tell you about sort of what mechanism might be binding it together. Spins, spin mediated mechanisms tend to bind very tight, very small Cooper pairs on the order of a couple of unit, a few unit cells. Phonons tend to bind much larger Cooper pairs. Uh, you can also, you'll notice in, in these ARPIS data, there's often a kink in the dispersions, like the, the velocity, band velocity seems to suddenly change. Uh, if you track the band velocity, these are uh, showing fits of band dispersion in an iron arsenide from uh, one of my papers. Uh, you'll see that, again, the velocity seems to be something up here and then it suddenly changes. Uh, the difference between velocity at the Fermi level and uh, average velocity of the thing uh, tells you, so velocity, uh, average velocity, 
sort of average velocity or velocity it converges to be beneath the kink divided by vel velocity of the Fermi level minus one gives you something that's called the electron boson coupling constant. This kink tends to say that you're coupling to a phonon or spin mode at the energy where the at the energy that corresponds to where the kink exists. Uh, so if you subtract this uh, this sort of base velocity uh, off well, this base dispersion off from the kink dispersion, you'll say that there's maybe a boson mode around this energy. It's always hard to uh, to track things over a long enough, uh, over a large enough range, and, and rely on uh, it's. Uh, these estimates are always a little bit rough. I wouldn't treat them as being hugely quantitative. But anyway, so you can see kinks that reflect coupling to bosons and tell you about the boson, how strongly you're coupling to the bosons. And uh, that's, these, these basic characterizations are why ARPUS is very broadly applied to, uh, to superconductors. You really couple to the low energy physics of interest. Uh, a couple of last things that I won't dwell on because I'm running a bit long. Uh, the technology we use for ARPUS at synchrotrons, uh, the synchrotron technology in general is in the middle of a huge generational upgrade. Uh, it, we're, synchrotrons have gone through several generation up, generational upgrades in the past. The very first synchrotrons were just uh, some guys apparently went to cyclotron high energy physicists and said, can I drill a hole through your shielding? Because I like it that your, that your electrons cast off, your accelerated particles cast off very intense electromagnetic waves, and I want to use those for my experiments. And of course, in the 1970s, safety was lax, and they said, sure, just drill away. Uh, and uh, so anyway, as time has gone on, it became possible to uh, use computers to really optimize how you're directing the gener uh, the uh, uh, processes that generate light in a synchrotron. Most recently, the electron beam that that goes through a magnetic field that generates the uh, the light. Oops. Uh, it's been realized that if you, this is 500, minus 500 to plus 500 microns, this is the profile of, of the beam at the ALS these days. Uh, if you focus it down to a spot, if you make it much smaller on this horizontal axis, the light that you get out gain, becomes very coherent in plane. The coherence of the light in plane tells you how much of the light you can focus down to a tiny spot on your sample. So. Newer synchrotrons are improving their coherent light flux, their co sort of coherent fraction estimated in a, in a weird way, by an order of magnitude. Uh, ALS and APS are sort of the previous, representing the previous generation, and the new generation of synchrotrons are all up by about an order of magnitude in coherent flux in the soft X-ray range, uh, and VUV a bit less than that. So, that means that everyone is starting to realize they can keep their photons and focus down to 100 nanometers or a micron or something like that on their sample. So these spectroscopies that have been done with 300 micron spots, uh, if you focus down to 100 nanometers, you're seeing something very different. Uh, you have a problem in that you've put too much flux in too small an area, so you tend to charge and you tend to damage your sample. But you can raster your beam and get images that are spatially resolved uh, and sort of piece together something that has two extra dimensions of information. I have a, a graduate student, uh, Erica, who unfortunately isn't here right this moment, uh, who these are the sorts of sparse images that you get from individual spots, who showed how, how you can use sort of an average image as a template to, to lock onto this and see how uh, electronic structure varies over, over the surface of a material and do interesting science with that. So this is something that is becoming available everywhere. It's sort of the next generation of the technique. Uh, and the analytic tools for it are still in development. Uh, so I'll skip over what, what we can do with it. We can sort of see how bands hybridize with one another by looking at their energetics in different places. You can get some new experimental observables uh, from it, and you can deal with with samples that have more complicated surfaces. The last thing I want to highlight is that pump probe ARPUS, if I come in with 
Uh, if I come in with a pumping beam, I can create a whole bunch of electronic excitations before I do ARPAs. This is an example on a topological insulator. The Fermi level is down here. After you put in a, a pump, you see a bunch of, ex of electrons in higher energy bands uh, that are uh, decaying into to fill the holes that you've created in the band structure. So um, this is, for a topological insulator, these states can last for picoseconds. These electrons can last in excited states for picoseconds. It gives you some time to measure them and, and see what the unoccupied band structure is. Uh, also, your pump can fundamentally change the many body order in the system. It can change other properties. Uh, in this pump probe configuration, resolving on the scale of a few hundred femtoseconds, you can uh, see how the electronic structure was coupled to those properties, how it changes when that happens. Uh, really giving a survey of that would be its own talk, but it's, the pictures and videos are very cool. This comes from ZX Chun's website. I, uh, I happened to notice it a while back and liked it. So, uh, so again, you get very broad basic information about the three plus one dimensional band structure of materials. Uh, application to topological materials lets you, rec lets you see what the topology is because you see if you have an even or odd number of surface states. Um, application to superconductors, you get a lot of fundamental parameters about how they work, how big the, super, the superconducting gap is, what its distribu distribution is in momentum space, and how big the Cooper pairs are, that sort of thing. Uh, and there's a lot more coming now that we have better beam properties and as the technology is improving. So uh, thank you very much. And